Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, of course, trying to memorize your names, but um, there is some slips, but we will, we will um, try to keep up the pace. So, you the glasses there. Did you attend the first lectures? No. You did. What was your name? Sonia. Sonia? Ronja. Ronja. Where were you from again? Germany, okay, I just need to, yeah, any questions? Yeah, let me just repeat where you can find these videos, okay? So you, you enter uh, the school's webpage, and unfortunately, as I said, um, the English version is not good to find to find this. Hopefully, it will be fixed. So you need to go to ah, where is it? I'm going to the student page. It seems. So if you go to the direct home page, there should be a link to these H I M O the X, and you just go in there. And of course, then you need to know what to do to do in unless you don't need. A, because most of you don't know Norwegian, so uh, just hit this second one twenty seven here. This is a number probably changing, and then go down to find my name. Okay, just click it, and then you get all the courses which I am responsible for at the moment. And uh, these courses are there IDR seven twenty. So just go in here, and then click videos. You can understand videos even if it has an E R in the end which of course is the Norwegian version, video where. Okay, and then you see uh, I've been uh, doing some uh, editing here as well, so you uh, can actually uh, see the content. So one, one means the first day, first hour, one, two means the first day, second hour and so on, and then move to two, one, two, three, and so on. So today will be three, one, three, two, and so on. Okay, so you probably understand the system now. Okay. Um, then uh, we go into Frontier, uh, and of course I have to go in as an employee here to get the right login. Uh, today we will continue in Chapter 2 where we left uh, last week, and then hopefully start uh, seriously on Chapter 3. So do we have any questions to, to the progress so far? I see all students uh, tend to sit in the back of the auditorium. I, I always do the same, okay? So, but you, you uh, the reason, of course, is that you feel that then you can kind of sleep through certain parts and you can do that unnoticed. But of course, as long as I know it, that's really not an option. So, you might as well just sit anywhere, okay? It's uh, it's not kind of beneficial to sit in the back when I'm teaching. It's uh, it can kind of work the other way around. So, uh, if you're afraid of me kind of pointing at you, asking you questions. Then, Matt, this is not a good uh, location. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the problem, this is kind of unfair, isn't it? Because the guys I and girls, I know the names on, they, they kind of will be asked in general. So the best uh, strategy here is, put is uh, uh, supposed to avoid me knowing your names. How to do that, I don't know. Okay. This was uh, the first lecture in game theory, wasn't it? For those of you who know that concept at all, we will hopefully return to that a little bit in the end. Okay, uh, let's choose English here. Danish, maybe? No, we don't have that. There is even a Chinese option here. Have you <coughs> tried that? <coughs> have you tested it? No. You haven't? It would be funny. I don't think we have time. Okay. So, uh, as always, we I, I do it like this. I display all the rooms, and then I pick the given room here, which is this one. And then um, uh, lecture notes, and then it's... Uh, you see the sorting here is changing. The reason is, of course, that I find typos all the time, so I keep making changes in the document. So if you downloaded all these at the start of the course, then it may be a good idea to re-download it, okay? because I'm, I'm doing some editing as we move along here. So both these two and three has been changed since last time, because I found a few errors, okay, just to keep you informed about 
why things are as they are. So we just have to wait for these to come up. Then we have, have to find where we left last time. And if I'm not completely wrong, we left at this point, didn't we? This was the last slide we looked at yeah. last time. And the idea here is that we're looking at this elasticity concept. And as I said last time, elasticities are kind of single numbers which, or actually it could even be functions, okay? Keep in mind that, okay? It doesn't have to be numbers, it could be functions, depending on the mathematical structure of the demand curve, basically. But the idea is that to have some kind of different representation of a demand curve, typically, or at least hopefully, given by a number. Uh, I said you can kind of think of elas an elasticity, at least it's, it's given in numerical form as a kind of similarity to an average representing a, a population or something. So it's kind of a, a measure which kind of sums up something here. In this case, it sums up either the demand curve or the supply curve. And uh, at the bottom here, as it says, uh, an elasticity answers questions like if we increase the price on our football tickets with 10%, how many percent reduction should we expect in the number of spectators? Of course, given that we do not consider football being a luxury good or a special type of good, we assume that if we increase prices, less football fans will come to see the match. So. Uh, by this construction, which was def defined on the, the last slide here. Uh, I think we should perhaps do so it like this. Then there is, of course, a logic here. Okay, We kind of take the percentual change in one variable, divide it by the percentual change in another variable, and then we get some kind of number, uh, typically either larger than one or less than one, don't we? So if the number on top of the denom denom denominator is larger than uh, the number on the bottom, then we get a number a bit slightly larger than one. Okay, that tells us that kind of the these change is to some extent bigger than these change. The other way around, of course, the other way around in the argument. So that is kind of the logical link between the concept, which of course is straightforward alg algebra here, uh, until the kind of explanation we see here. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, sensible to use the discrete form like this. In other cases, especially given that we have uh, mathematical expressions for the demand and or the supply curves, then it's perhaps sensible to use these forms. So let's spend a little bit of time looking on uh, this form, okay? So according to what it says here on the slide, EP is, uh, we can think of it as a definition, price divided by quantity multiplied with this concept here, dq over dp. We normally pronounce it like that, dq over dp. And I said last time that that, that actually means that we should substitute the, the derivative of a certain function here for this expression. So dq or dp means the derivative of q as a function of p. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that to be able to compute this one directly, unless we really want to delve into mathematics, which I haven't planned, then we kind of need to have this demand curve in a special fashion, okay? To compute it directly like this, we need to have q as a function of p, if you like. So we need some expression, let's say q equals to 10 minus 2p, for instance. That is in a suitable form, okay? Then we can find the derivative of this function with respect to the variable p, and that would produce this answer. So if we do that then, if we calculate dq, dp in this example case, we'll have to take the derivative of 10, which is zero, it's a constant, and then the derivative of this part, which contains our variable p. Of course, the derivative is the constant in front of p. So it's minus two in this case then. The problem 
which kind of many students seem to struggle with here is that in most cases, also in the textbook, uh, or actually, no, sorry, in some cases, uh, we may have these written on a different form. We may have it with p as the isolated variable on the right. Of course, we can, in any situation, invert, invert such a function, can't we? So instead of having q isolated on the left hand <coughs> side, here, we can do some manipulations here to achieve with p as the only variable on one of the sides. So if we do that, then we of course can move 2p to the left, then we get 2p plus q, q is still on the left, and the 10 is only remaining here, and then of course we can move the, move the q to that right hand side, then we have 10 minus q, don't we? And then of course we have to divide by 2 here to isolate p on the left hand side. So this is another way of expressing exactly what we expressed here, the meaning is the same. And of course, if we were interested in finding dp dq, alternatively, then of course we could use this form <coughs> directly. So you see, in some cases we have to do inversion here. So we have to kind of change, interchange <coughs> the variables to make it fit. But in general, this is a nice construction because normally we tend to have q on the first axis and p on the second axis when we draw demand curves or supply curves, and in that case it doesn't impose any problems. You see that? Because thinking mathematically, if we were to plot the function, this is kind of the variable which is would be the, the answer when we input a certain Q expression. So this would refer to P as a function of Q, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you see, I was wrong. We have to invert it in most cases. So the gen normal way of doing this implies that we have to actually do this in most cases to get it on the right form if this is our target. Yes? Don't you get the very bottom left where it says dq would be equal to negative two? I get it from this one. I take the derivative of this function. Now if you could think of, if we use other, other letters here, then maybe then it would be easier to see what <coughs> I'm doing. Of course, if we use y equal to 10, minus 2x then, that's kind of the form you're, you're known to. Yeah. We want to find the derivative here. That's minus 2, isn't it? Yeah. This is what we're doing here. Nothing else. Okay, so yeah. is the fact that q and p are involved in it make it immediately dp dp? Because you don't have to like put one over the other before you get the derivative? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what you know. But I don't want to delve into this. But of course, if there is something you can write this as. But I don't think we should go into that okay. concept. Okay, so for this case, if we're interested in dq divided by dp, it means the derivative of the q function as a function of p. Oh, okay. The meaning means to to find. Maybe we should say here to find. Uh, not here. Here means to find the derivative of q as a function of p. So be aware of this, okay? In most cases, you have p as the variable on the second axis, meaning that p extends. So typically, you have these construct given a normal demand fu function or supply function structure. So in order to find this, then, then you have to actually do this inversion in that direction, the opposite way around. Of course, the structure is just simply simple manipulation, but you must be prepared that in some cases, some exercises, it could be necessary to do this. Okay. Now, the textbook in the next parts tries to give, should we say, a more relevant example on the use of elasticities. And the idea now is to look at the following situation. Suppose somebody gave us two elasticities a demand elasticity and a supply elasticity for a given market. Okay. In addition, we need to assume that we are able to observe the market equilibrium, meaning that we need information on what the market price is as well as the quantity 
sold in that market. So we kind of need fee four pieces of information, two <coughs> elasticities. Somebody give you gives us this, or we can look them up on the internet or whatever. And we also need to be able to observe the market equilibrium. From a practical point of view, it's always much easier to observe the price in the market equilibrium, isn't it? Because we can go into the market and buy something. Then we observe the price directly. But the amount of products sold in the market is not easy for anybody to, to observe. Okay? We need some extra information to get that. Of course, if there's only a, a single agent selling, then we can ask him. But normally that's not the case. Especially not if we, if we observe a perfectly competitive market, which, as we said last time, should include a huge amount of sellers or producers. But the idea then is, given that we have this information, and another assumption, that the demand and supply curve are linear. Given that set of assumptions, it turns out to be straightforward to actually find the demand and supply curves. So you can think of elasticities as some help in estimating or finding demand and supply curves. Because uh, in certain cases, you will be interested in analyzing this. We, we talked about this last time, that you have these, these uh, market equilibrium schemes, so to speak. And of course, in order to see what's happening here, if there are changes in demand or and or in supply, you need to have these curves, don't you? And if these elasticities are kind of easily available, then this is kind of a a reasonable way of thinking. So let's look at such an example. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Elasticities are important as info is available. By that I mean that we kind of there are sources of information where we can kind of look up these elasticity. Okay, in Norway, for instance, this Bureau of Statistics kind of publishes elasticities several times a year, and we can kind of pinpoint a certain market, say the market for bread or whatever, and then uh, then there are numbers available to kind of find. Uh, it says further on we can use info on elasticities, for instance, to find demand or supply curves, or maybe and. And let us look at an example. So the information, as I said, we need we need to have Q. And then I put this star on the Q. It's an implicit signal that this is a, an equilibrium solution. Okay, so this tells us that this is kind of a market which is stable and it, it has a certain quantity which is sold. So in this case, that quantity is 12. It's a number which I said previously may not be that easy to find, but <coughs> here we assume we have it. This one is straightforward to find, isn't it? Just to go and buy something. In that case, the market price is something. In this case, it is two. Okay, so we need these two pieces of information. And of course, an underlying assumption here that this is a perfectly competitive market to be able to use this crossing, which we will need later on. In, in addition to these two, we also need these two elasticities. In this case, there is a supply elasticity, ES which is 1.5, and a demand elasticity, ED, which is minus 0 0.5. And assumption, of course, demand and supply curves don't have to be linear, OK? In many cases, we draw them like this. In that case, they are linear, but they get could very well be like this, couldn't they? So it, it's not given that they are straight lines. So in this case, if the we assume that, then we can then we can mathematically describe our demand as Q equals to A minus B P. And of course, what we're aiming now for is to find these A and B here. Okay, we don't know those numbers. We want to try to use this information to find these two as well as similar parameters in the supply curve. Q 
equal to C it should be, shouldn't it? Still typos. Huh? Of course, there must be a C here. It's not the same thing. Okay, so that should be a C. Sorry about that. Let me fix it immediately. Okay. Yeah, I need to. Oh, it got right, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, so this is the kind of starting point. Okay, this is the information we have. We make an assumption that we are looking for at linear demand curves, and then the question is how can we find this number, this number, this number, and this number given this information? Okay, let me show you. Yeah, do we need to write this? Now, you perhaps remember that E S or E P uh, or E D. Of course, they have the same structure. This P over Q, isn't it, times D Q D P. So you see, in this case, it's neat because we have given it in the right form. We can take the derivatives directly here now. Sorry. Yeah. That's the one in uh, one and What is this? Yeah, this is. Uh, ES is the supply elasticity, ED is the demand elasticity. So if you return to this one, I looked at something I call D here and S here. So there's one elasticity for the demand curve and one for the supply curve. I was just asking about what is the Q? Q, I think it's comma. It's a comma. Either this one or this one can be found by this formula. Okay? Of course, you to be perfectly correct now, I should have S and S and S and S and similarly D and D and D, but to kind of short it down, it's, it's just this formula we use to find it. And we can, of course, compute this formula directly here, can't we? By these structures. So if we look at the demand side, then the derivative OQ with respect to P is then the derivative of this expression. The variable here is the p, a and b are constant. So the derivative of that one is zero, the derivative of that part would be minus <coughs> b then. So this is minus b. Just the same as in the example previously, but the minus two is now substituted with minus b, because it has minus b here, not minus two. <coughs> now similarly for the supply part, Again, we want to find this d, q, d, p, but now it's this equation we're looking at. The derivative here is, of course, zero, that part, and plus d for the second part. So this is d, okay? So the derivatives here are these numbers, okay? In order to utilize this information, we have to look at the formula itself. And the formula is, of course, as it says on top here, so given that we look at the supply elasticity, 1.5, should then equal P star over Q star divided by DQ over DP. DQ over DP, we have it, don't we? It's here. So we can enter minus B for this expression. P star we have, it's 2. Q star we have, it's 12. So we have everything we need now to construct an equation which hopefully involves a single variable so, so that we can solve it. So let's input that information on the right hand side here. In that case, we keep 1.5. P star was 2. Q star was 12, wasn't it? Let's return to check. P Q star is 12. P star is 2. That's correct. And the derivative on the demand side is minus b, so we should multiply by minus b, shouldn't we? <coughs> what did you say? It isn't 1.5, it's 0 0.5. Perfectly. Very nice of you. I missed it. I used the other one, okay? Now, hopefully it could be correct. 
yeah the first which is here because this is a straightforward equation one unknown bar b and we can find it okay it shouldn't be minus three here should it <coughs> it should be three shouldn't it you see that minus here and minus here we can take the minus two a so b should be a half times 12 over 2 which is 6 which is 3 so again there is typos here <laughs> so b should be 3 then and the, then we have found one of these four unknown parameters we can do a similar operation of course to find this unknown d uh, similar here we just take this unknown divided by this ratio which of course is the same it's the same <coughs> market equilibrium and in that case it should equal 1.5 so we get d equal to 9 in that case now note here that we assume there is a negative sign here okay so when we find 3 here we have to withdraw it when we in enter it here so you so this is really not wrong here that there should be a minus here okay that's correct the only error is actually here it should be b plus so everything else is correct okay so this information produces two of these unknown parameters b equal to to two plus three then sorry about the minus here and d equal to nine then there are two remaining unknowns a and c and to be able to find those, we have some extra information here, don't we? Because we know that the intersection between the supply curve and the demand curve is at a given point, which we know. Okay, Q star e is equal to, uh, equal to 12, and P star equals 2. So this point we have. And both of these straight lines goes through these points. Obviously, you can just enter it to construct two new equations to find the remaining two unknowns. And that's what's going on here. The first demand curve should go through Q equals 12 and P equals 2. Okay, you have here and here. And then we found this plus 3 over there. So that must be entered. And the minus must be kept given the assumption here. We assume that it's going in that direction from the start here. And then, of course, the A is kept. So this equation then produces a certain A, okay, just by, by the A as the only unknown. unknown. 3 times 2 is 6. So it's uh, 12 on the left-hand si side and a minus 6 on the right-hand side. And of course, moving 6 to the one of the sides, perhaps uh, mainly that one, it changes sign. So it's 12 plus 6. So we, enter, we end up with a equals to 18. Now we have found 3 out of 4. And a similar thing is done on the supply curve. Then we just enter this point into the supply curve, 2 for price. 12 for quantity, and of course, these unknown parameter uh, D, which we found to be 9 up there. So that produces C equal to minus 6. Then, of course, we can write up our finished demand curve and supply curve with all information necessary. Both A, B, and C, D are now found. And, uh, it's just to put them in and write up the demand and supply curve. So the idea is, in a sense, simple, although it could be kind of complex to construct such an example. Uh, that the idea on the textbook is to, to try to make an argument. Okay, what can we use these elastic elasticities for? And in this case, we can use them to construct a demand and a supply <coughs> curve given that they are assumed to be linear or alternatively that they are too parametric so if there is only two unknowns then we can construct 
four equations for a total of four unknowns if there are two unknowns in each of these supply and demand curves. So that is the idea here, okay? To give an argument for why elasticities could be useful. Okay? Any questions? Draw the graph. Yeah. Yes, I can. So you want uh, these uh, done more or less uh, correctly then? Uh, okay, yeah. okay. <coughs> yeah, should we do it on the board or could we do it in Excel or? Mm, on the board. On the board. Yeah. Okay. There are two curves. There is this demand curve which is uh, now found to be q equals to 18 minus 3p. Okay, and we have a supply curve, which is q equals to minus 6 plus 9p. Okay, is this correct? Is this the same expression as on the bottom there? Yeah. Now the easy thing here to draw this graph would be to cheat, wouldn't it? And to have Q on this axis and P on this axis. In that case we can draw them directly. Of course we have to do it a little bit more <coughs> accurate than I look at here. In that case it's straightforward. So let's try, okay? Uh, so we now kind of turn our axis around as, as to the normal case and have Q on the second and P on the first, and in that case, these structures fit perfectly. Okay, if I put P equal to zero here, I get 18. So Q up to 18 must, so if I put 20 here, 10 here, then that seems like a sensible range, agree? If I put P <coughs> equal to zero here, I get minus six. Ah, I d my board isn't big enough, is it? I need, I should have, put these higher up, but okay, minus 6 is not that bad. Q equal to minus 6, if this is minus 5, here is minus 6, okay? I'm just checking the ranges now. That's kind of how you do plots on a freehand manner. So by putting P equals to 0, I get these two numbers. I need to be in that range. Okay, so P equals to 0 produces an 18 value for Q. So if this is 18, this is one point on the demand curve, isn't it? This cross here. Let me find the other point. The other point is the intersection with the p-axis here. And that is formed by just equating these to zero. Then I have to move that in that direction. Then I get 18 equals to 3p. And I can keep on here dividing by 3 to get p equals to 18 thirds. That's at six, isn't it? How nice. Okay. So the demand curve as a, a point goes through that. And if this is five and this is ten, then six is here. So this is the other point we need to draw the demand curve. So this is our demand curve in this case. So next is the supply curve. We found that if P equals zero in the second equation up there, then Q equals minus six. So this is the point on the supply curve. Again, we do the same. We, we put the supply curve here equals to zero. That produces nine P no, no, not B, P, equal to, moving that on the other hand, we have to change the sign, so we get 6, don't we? So P equals 6, 9, which is 2 thirds, isn't it? Which is 0 0.67 or something. And that must be far down here, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so we, we are around there. So we get the supply curve, which kind of goes like this, okay? more or less uh, accurate. Do you agree? Was this correct? Let's hope so. 
But you need to, this was a good question. What was your name again? Dita. Dita. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, when we teach this stuff, we kind of keep forgetting that maybe some students are not, kind of don't speak this language fluently, drawing these curves. But it's very essential that we practice on it because it's very important in microeconomics to be able to do this. So now we saw an example. The alternative to this, of course, is to do it in Excel. Do you know how to do that? If you don't, I will show you in just five minutes, okay? <coughs> okay, here is Excel. You have, you have the, has anybody never tried Excel? <coughs> Matt, you have tried Excel? Yeah. Okay, so, you, so everybody have tried it? Okay, then you know how it works, don't, don't you? To, to, to plot, for instance, this demand curve, which I unfortunately, no. Let's start with the demand curve, okay? Q equals 18 minus 3P. Of course, then I need some p-values to kind of make my points to produce the graph, okay? So I start with the p-values. And it seems here that P equals to zero could be something. And then let me make some numbers, okay? We probably know that the, the key to Excel is to use these formulas. Do you know how to enter a formula in Excel? You start with an equal sign, and then you write the formula. So what I want to do now is to produce the number one, by adding one to the cell on top. And that should be A1 plus one, shouldn't it? Then I get one. And then of course you can copy simply by just dragging this one downwards to some point, maybe not that far. And then of course you get all these running numbers, which produces the possible P values in the first equation. Then of course I need to construct corresponding Q values that's straightforward, isn't it? Another formula. The formula is given. 18. 18 minus 3 times P. And P is, in this case, A1, isn't it? Because I want to enter the numbers on the left into my formula. Then I should get 18, shouldn't I? Right? On the first point here. And I do. And then, of course, I can just copy this one. What did I write? It says stands here, doesn't it? Equal 18 minus 3 times A1. And then I can simply, again, if I get this to work, drag this one down to copy a running content, that's the kind of key point to any software of this type, to get all the corresponding values. Now, if I want to ma make a graph, I just I just mark all of it, <coughs> and then what do I do? I have to insert something perhaps, yeah. And I have to insert a certain graph stuff. There's different things to choose for, but in this case you should use a scatter graph, okay? It plots x related to y. So uh, yeah, should we have uh, Something like this, perhaps. Uh, different choices here. It could be with or without the observations. It could be smoothed lines, non-smoothed lines. You know the difference between smoothed and non-smoothed? Because if you don't smooth, you get this if it's not a straight line. So it doesn't matter in this case because it should be a straight line, whether you smooth it or not. So let's look at this one. Okay. Then we got this curve, didn't we? It looked slightly different on my figure. That was has just to do with that with the range structure here, okay? Uh, would we be able to, to draw the other one as well? Yeah, that should be straightforward, shouldn't it? Yeah, I think so. We even It's even easier, isn't it? Be because we we have the P, uh, P points and we can just enter the formula for the supply curve here. Just similar matter to construct the necessary information to produce the supply curve. And the formula is Minus 6 plus 9p, always start with an equal sign, minus 6 plus 9 times, always use the star to denote times, and we put a1 there, and then we should get 6 as a starting point here, shouldn't we? Oh, sorry, minus 6, yeah, that's correct, and then we again do a copy operation here to produce the supply curve, and if you want to 
plot both in the same diagram, which we probably are interested in here. To of course, in this case, we know the equilibrium, so <laughs> it's not very fruitful. But again, the same, same procedure. Mark everything. Insert again the scatter points, and there you see. Of course, you see the scales here. Uh, they suddenly moved on to minus 100 here, so it's kind of much more condensed than the one we draw on the board. But it's actually exactly the same. Yes, Matt? How did you tell the third column to plot against column one instead of using column two for the other one? Automatically here, if you do as I like, so do it now. If you mark, if you mark <coughs> the numbers by starting there, and moving in that direction, going down, then you automatically get both the two, two and three plotted against the first. Really? Yes. Okay. If you want to do this differently, you can mark single columns, can't you? I think you should hit control or something. Yeah. So if you hit control, you can keep on marking out and in and, uh, and change directions and everything. But you have to kind of do this a few times to, to, to get used to it. That is relatively straightforward. So we got this. What happened to the other graph? Did it vanish? No, it's still there, as it should be. Okay. So do you want to have access to this uh, Excel sheet? Should I save it and put it on Pronto? Okay, let's do that. Save as. So what should we call it? Plotting demand and supply curves in Excel. And I should perhaps store this on the desktop. Let's uh, I'm not sure whether this works, actually, but let's try. Save. Yes, here it is. <coughs> Very nice. And then, of course, the next step is to upload it into Frontend. And then we don't use this lecture part, we use the added material part. Don't you think so? So we upload <coughs> a single file here from our computer, from the desktop. It's already there. And it's this one. Open. Save. So you can download it now. Okay, It's available for you. Uh, maybe we will use Excel a little bit more in this course. It's a neat thing to know and it's uh, hi handy to use if you really want to do some should we say mathematical microaction on this if you really want to look what's happening okay any questions to this procedure was I doing things a bit fast perhaps if you feel that of course you can go into the Excel document yourself and look at it all the formulas are there everything is present Okay, then it's a uh, 15 minutes break. Yeah.